I always have a complicated feeling about saying my student. I'd much rather say a student who uh, graced me with being able to work with her. Um, and in many ways, she gave me an insight into China that I would have otherwise not had by her work on spatial inequality, um, poverty, uh, and the urban form. Uh, this is an unusual talk for me because I almost never talk about cities, even though I'm in the consummate Department of Urban Studies and Planning in the field of planning in the United States. And that's because I'm a regionalist by, by training, which means I'm more or less a spatial economist. And I never felt particularly in love with cities as a system or a site of an intellectual investigation. I don't know exactly why. I was much more interested in the spaces in between and the scales around, the spatial scales around cities. But I realized that when I came back to MIT, I began to get involved in energy research there because we had launched this big project called the uh, MITE, the MIT Initiative on Energy. And I was one of the few social scientists that actually had any memory of what it meant. You know, back in the 70s, Energy was a really hot topic, and there were lots of people walking around doing work on it. By the 1980s, with the rise and the fall of oil prices, there was just much less interest. Uh, and we sort of lumbered along without being concerned about energy supply uh, until we had the spike in energy prices in the 90s, and then again in the early 2000s. Um, and I, so I came back to energy really more out of curiosity than anything else, even though my original background was uh, very much grounded in solar energy and trying to actually build the infrastructure at an individual building scale um, to you know, lead forward to a, a world of alternative energy. Well, we're not there yet. We tried in the 70s, and uh, we're trying again today, and I actually feel like we're getting uh, significantly closer to the mark. Um, let's see here. So I'll take just a minute to figure out which way I'm going. Um, so this talk was motivated by my curiosity of whether I had anything to say about cities at all. And I want to just warn you in advance that this is a completely um, formative discussion. It's not one that I have taken out of my back pocket and I'm just delivering it to you for the umpteenth time. In fact, it's actually me trying to sort out what some of these larger systemic processes mean when it has to do with the spatial allocation of economic opportunity, actually, of which I believe energy is a part. Um, and this talk was also motivated by a recent conversation that we had at MIT around uh, women in energy. We host annually an event of about 300 women from all over the world who are involved in energy of, uh, policy, energy technology, uh, energy implementation. And um, the leadership of this group is made up of eminent women in energy from around the world. I mean, you know, secretaries of state, national leaders, things like that. Um, and they decided that energy in cities would be the topic for this week, this year. And, and so then, of course, we were all scrambling to try to figure out what did that actually mean. Because at MIT, despite the fact that we have the, probably arguably the best and the biggest planning department in the country, our relationship between the an energy initiative and, and uh, dust aren't all that uh, robust even though a third of the energy consumption, and much more so as we go forward, is actually uh, engaging energy and, and uh, the physical, um, the, the built environment. Um, and so this is an attempt to try to figure out what would, how do we think about this, and what does it mean, and where does it matter? And um, uh, so uh, I will also say that I am in the process of taking an experience I had last fall, which was teaching a class in Moscow, uh, Russia, where a new university is being built um, in collaboration between Russia and uh, MIT. And I was the social scientist. Uh, I suppose it started out, I was token. It turned out it was much more than that. Uh, and the, the class is focused on a global perspective on energy decisions, markets, and policy. I'm primarily a sectoral specialist, so if you ask me what I know how to do, I know how to study industries. Um, and I know a bit about China, a bit about Russia, a little bit about Africa, because my husband's an exploitation geologist who is currently in the field looking for uranium. Um, uh, but primarily know a lot about America, and I've worked on American um, geographically based 
energy policy in particular in Appalachia, although I began working in the um, uh, western U.S. when I was uh, a grad student. Um, so this, this is actually a person with a relatively, a slightly higher than New York Times level understanding of all of this, asking the simple question of what role does, uh, what role do cities play in the future um, consumption patterns of energy and to what extent are the challenges ahead for us ones which are technology, um, political power base, um, or uh, those of emotion. So I'm interested in where we are at the moment, and I actually think we're much further along than much of the, the political rhetoric suggests. And so one has to ask the question, if we have a lot of technological capability, <clears throat> why is there still so much uncertainty and um, hand-wringing, actually, about what a non-sole fossil fuel future might look like? The punchline to my talk is that, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, for the future, at least for the next uh, 25 years, uh, energy policy is urban policy, and urban policy is going to be energy policy. And that has to do with a confluence of events, which one might be provoking the other, or they just might be two ships passing together rather than apart in the night. Uh, and this diagram is just symbolic of the whole conceptual world that is very far ahead in thinking about what energy in cities might mean. This is the Thames in England, and uh, what you see here are fanciful designs by architects imagining that we could capture the wind that comes off of the river as a source of energy. And I happen to be in a technology university now where uh, every conceivable idea and gizmo and widget that somebody could manufacture in their head or put on a computer is the conversation of daily existence. Uh, uh, so there's a lot that's out there, and the question is, what's going to happen with it? I'm a policy economic geographer, and that means that um, I'm unlikely to pursue questions that are purely theoretical, uh, probably because I'm not that good at theory. I'm adequate. Uh, I'm really interested in solving puzzles that have meaning and actually manifest in places. Uh, and I'm really curious about why things happen and uh, what they really consist of. And for me, the world I live in is this wonderful, rich puzzle. And it is a day-to-day -day experience as to which puzzle I'm working on. And I can't say I get many of them solved, but I have a great time doing it. Um, my work as a methodological uh, um, point of departure is uh, a combination of qualitative and quantitative analysis. I do policy analysis. But if I was to say what I do when I first start a problem is I'm looking at patterns. I'm literally looking at patterns in data, conversations, policy edicts, and I'm trying to figure out what the drivers are behind those so that I can understand something about their systemic qualities. As an economic geographer, we study sectors, we study actors, that is agency, who acts with volition at the local level. Institutions, uh, norms and practices is what I mean when I use that term, regulations. And I am mindful of and schooled by the field of geography to situate whatever it is I do in a cultural context. So for example, going to Russia and working on Russia I actually didn't even try. And the reason is because the cultural context is so complicated and the, and the political circumstances that I was in, situated in were such that to study Russia and energy could likely lead to political problems that I couldn't anticipate. So I chose China instead, which isn't any less political or complicated. But I didn't feel as if the, the shadow of the constant conflict which is going on around energy, energy prices, supply, demand, et cetera, was quite so evident. Um, I am ultimately interested in politics and the politics of persuasion because I think that uh, as a, an academic, we have the capacity and in some sense I feel we have the responsibility to take our learned abilities and use them in a, in a gentle way with audiences that are susceptible to listening to the possibilities of change for the world at large. Um, uh, I'm not a student of political science, but I definitely recognize that understanding 
politics, deep politics, is essential to any type of policy process. So some of my comments will be about aspects of politics as I go on. So it is not an accident that I'm looking at cities. And I would say right up front that a, there's a big chunk of caveat in my talk about the ability to measure anything. And even if you can measure it, it doesn't stay still long enough for it to actually be something we can model very precisely. That doesn't mean I don't have great respect for my colleagues who do modeling or try to model complex systems that are moving in time and space. It's much more that I understand just how difficult it is empirically and also know something about the politics behind doing that. But it's easy to look at the question of the urban and energy because we are going from a once agricultural society to a society that is increasingly geographically aggregated. Uh, and it's a really in important moment to try, it's at the beginning, it's not at the beginning in the sense of zero up to 50, but there still is a big space between 50 and 100. So there's plenty of room to make additions and change that have positive consequences for people. These statistics I think are very powerful. I myself am somebody who uses history to start my work. I have to situate myself historically because I feel like it's rude otherwise. It assumes I know something that hasn't come before me or that I ignore it because it's irrelevant. I think it's very fundamental. But just imagine that 2% of the world's population lived in cities in, in uh, 1800. That only 50% at the dawn of the 21st century lived in geographic aggregations. That is, they came off of the land and are somewhere within a boundary space in which they are probably closer to the innards of that complex than the outers of it. Um, is that me? Um, 60 percent is projected to be uh, living in urban areas and ultimately people are saying things like 70 percent of the world's population living in, in uh, cities by 2050. Now imagine that from the standpoint of where we are today and think about what the consequences of that will be for the places you know are urban. So just take the megacities, right? So Tokyo at the, you know, 20 million plus, or uh, Beijing or Shanghai or some of these monstrous places. Are those places going to continue to grow even bigger? What does it mean to be that big now? And how can we learn from that large scale for the future? And will the urban patterns look at all like that as we go on? Imagine that Tokyo, the population today, was, is uh, what the world's population was in 3000 BC. It's just, it's awesome, actually. It's, it's frightening because think of how all that stuff is we have to get from one place to the other. The great thing about the spatial distribution of people when they were living in urban and peri-urban areas is that you actually could have systems of consumption and production that were somewhat geographically distinct without massive amounts of movement of stuff. Now, you might have not had a, a, an enormously diverse living space, but you also, at the same time, had some potential for uh, self-reproduction. If for no other reason, you could grow your own food. We're now talking about people that will be 40 miles from the core of a city to the edge where there's any open land where food could be produced. I mean, what does that mean for the future we're building and the ways in which we have to uh, adjust for that? What's driving this process? Why is the world becoming urban? Well, there's no single answer, right? So we could argue, I'd love to have somebody from a Chinese scholar tell me what is driving what's going on in China. I mean, I can use migration theory. I can say why people go to cities because there are opportunities there. I can say people go to cities because they are being pushed out of where they are now. Uh, I can also say for lifestyle reasons why people move, because they're old enough, they don't have to stay where they are, they actually have the potential, or there might be other mechanisms that are moving them. But there also are much bigger processes and structures that are moving people around or keeping them where they were, the huko in China, which has historically had some mediating influence of where people are. How many people think the huko will be operating in 10 years of my Chinese caller friends? It's not actually, it's not actually operating now, but that was a whole 
model to keep people from moving around because it was very difficult to imagine a world with a billion something people who all had the right to migrate wherever they wanted to go. Well, that's where we are. So why is it happening? For a whole host of reasons. Some are economic, some are lifestyle, some are political because people are being pushed out and pushed into refugee camps that become basically cities. Um, the interesting issue for me is of the places that are becoming urban, where are they? What kind of places are they? Are they places that were, when we think about urbanization, there's about four or five reasons that we have historically had urban concentrations. Commercial factors, some sort of economic base, some entrepot, um, some kind of totally lifestyle, right? So there, it, these are things we can understand. But now we're in a world in which the ways that places are going to grow and where they're going to grow are a bit different from what we've seen in the past. We actually know from project population projections that it's possible the growth is going to come and go toward the least developed areas. So not the places that had the greatest potential, because places always have some relative level of potential. But these are places that actually right now are not very developed but they're moving forward rapidly and they're either intervening opportunities between point A and point B, or there's some other force which is bringing them uh, to, the, to the stage of possible development. So we're not just talking about piling more people in the same places. And we're not talking about just the same places which are already developed simply getting more urban. We are actually talking about places that are neither the place where things might go necessarily based on existing geography, or are they places that um, actually have the sort of nascent, nascent elements of it? We're talking about places that are not very developed right now. The whole, think, of the, think of the resource consequences of that. So it's one thing when you're moving things to an already established system of inputting or outputting. Imagine if you're talking about places that will come out of whole cloth, they'll come out of the desert right and they will manifest and they will need all the bits and pieces of infrastructure in order for that to work and they will need to be interconnected because we've become an interconnected world megacities are the 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 um at, at one point i think megacities were probably part of the imaginary right these giant places with millions of people and uh, you know fred um the jetsons do you have someone have, are any of you old enough to remember the Jetsons? Remember and he'd fly around in that little bucket and he'd zoom around and there were roads every which way and yet he was riding even above those. You know, and, and you had no idea what scale that place was, right? But it had to be big because he was flying around, right? You, you, don't, you could walk otherwise. Well, so the mega cities are what, what a lot of people in industry and in Siemens and in General Electric and all of these organizations which have the capacity to provide infrastructure, they talk about that a lot. But what the projections suggest is that we're going to see this whole new level of mid-range, you know, 500,000 to 5 million cities. So imagine what that's going to look like and imagine what the city system will look like and imagine what the interconnectivity and resources are going to be. Yes, we're going to have mega cities. They might even get a bigger, although I think that we're starting to see dysfunctionality at levels that are going to be um, impossible to manage. Just think about the spatial distribution of water relative to where large concentrations are. That will become a rate limiting factor. People will move to the hinterland simply because there isn't certain things like the adequate supply, except for in places like China when we will actually reverse the flow of water across entire regions. But my point is, it isn't going to be the places that we already know. It's likely to be places that are just at the early stages. And one of the things we know about early stage development is it's off of a flat plane and everything has to be built up. And then there is a process that accelerates to a point where there's a takeoff and you get this kind of integrated urbanization. But in the short run, it's very energy intensive until it actually develops some kind of system complexity that actually starts to feed on itself. Where else, where, can you go, can you, uh, you can barely see any of this, isn't that right? I hate this, I'm, I apologize for that. Um, so I'm gonna, t I'm gonna tell you what this says. So this is a chart that it, of the total urban and rural population by major area selected periods 1950 to 2015. 
And what we have here are regions. We have proportions of urban population and rural population. And the punchline is, where is all this going to happen? Where is it going to happen? It's going to happen in Africa, and it's going to happen in Asia. It's, um, Asia is already on a very extraordinary trajectory. The actual rate of change initially in Africa and, and, and continuing through time will be uh, more substantial than Asia, but the actual numbers of people will show up in larger numbers uh, in Asia than in Africa. And they're for two different reasons, I submit. And I'd love somebody to actually tell me I'm wrong because then I'd go find out another answer. I think Africa is just simply going to continue to be the resource pool that it has for the last 200 years. That just like my husband is out there looking for uranium, he's also got friends who are working in oil, who are working in gas, who are working in base metals. They got a fact, they've got a mine in Sierra Leone that's basically shut down right now because of Ebola, but it's a 2,000 person mine that just came on and is expected to operate for 50 years. Um, so we have these two places that are, and that's not all, you know, think about how relatively small the geographic space that is compared to the world as a whole, the, the world's land masses. We're not talking anything about Russia with uh, 11 time zones, right? We're not talking about Latin America, we're talking about two places. So not only is, are we gonna become urban, but we're gonna become urban in spaces that are relatively um, narrowly scripted, and I would argue, at least in the Africa case, you're going to be urbanizing in an environment that is hostile, which does not have a vast amount of water that is easily controlled, um, has extreme temperature variation, um, and a whole host of other factors which, again, we have to control as we're managing our way to a new energy future. Um, and then this is just a, a, a percentage of urban by major area for selected periods. Africa is at this point 14% in 1950. It's going to be 60% by 2050. Asia 70% in 1950. It's going to be 64. So we're going to have this lopsided urban world in which the global north, us, are very urbanized. And the global south will be less urbanized which means where will growth take place? It's gonna to continue to go in these targeted areas, and we have to think about what the resource consequences are of that. So one of the things that's really amazing is to uh, consider for a moment what the physical form is of this urban world we're all gonna be a part of. And I could have picked any set of pictures because they're all amazing. Um, each, I picked these three for a reason. I wanted to give you a, a range of realities. So, Shanghai. Now, if that doesn't look like the Jetsons, I don't know what, right? This is a world that was just constructed. In, in 1980, this was not there. These did not exist as buildings. Premier pieces of architecture. Nigeria, actually a, a relatively low density city with some um, uh, commercial activity, but a, a relatively uh, I would say it's dense, but it's actually less dense than uh, Bangalore. And, um, and they're operating with two different streams of development pressure. <clears throat> India trying to develop urban areas as fast as it possibly can, and Nigeria struggling to figure out what it's going to do, even though it's one of the richest resourced uh, uh, countries in the world. So is that what the future is going to look like? Is it going to be this, 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 or maybe something else? Each one of them has an energy profile. Of all of these, which one do you think is the most energy intensive? The China one. That's, and why do you think that? Um, I don't know. Maybe. Well, that was actually a good guess, and the, and the answer is because as you move up income brackets, people have more money to spend, and energy is basically a derived demand. As your income rises, you want more things, and they tend to have more embodied energy in them. So this one is probably the most energy intensive. And that's one of the big questions is, as we move forward in time, are we going in this direction? And, and by the way, these are, are these very energy intensive? These two kind of places, places with large slums and some high rises? 
they're not. As a matter of fact, from the Global North perspective, if we can just keep the world occupied like this, we're going to be able to have all the world we have now and more. And that, to me, is one of the really big distributive dilemmas. Because underlying this is a politics that is really bad for people who live there, and a place which is a democracy that has a lot of struggle over exactly the process of urbanization. The whole national policy is sort of framed around how are we going to urbanize, who's going to have property. Property, of course, is wealth, right? Because if you have a piece of land, you can go to the bank and borrow against it, which means you can actually have a future which is different than your present. Um, so what are we going to do? What is the energy system going to look like? So what do we have now? And are we going to reproduce it? Um, uh, I'll show you something in a minute, and, uh, and we'll, I'll see what you think about this. So this is just an example of energy infrastructure. I could have taken any picture. I could have taken a nuclear power plant or a hydro plant. Um, but the point is, is the scale of these types of energy interventions map the scale of the population of urban concentrations we are talking about. We're not talking about American Midwestern cities that are 250,000 to 500,000, right? America's got, America's got a distribution of about 325 cities. 25 of them are really big. The next 100 are, you know, between 500,000 and, and maybe a million, and then there's all the rest. We're talking about big, big investments cement, right? Tons of cement and steel and things like that. So which one of these? All of these? None of these? Or is this the future? Knowing what you know about the geography of Africa, do you think that renewable energy at a large scale, given the topography, the climate, and the weather, do you think it can be a solution to that region? Are there any Africanists? I think it can be, but with the sort of the political um, inequalities as it being, in the, as you referred to it being a distraction, being a continent of distraction where the global north goes in and extracts that wealth and moves it out, it leaves it, it undermines um, the ability of people Can be a solution. The technology can be a solution, but not without the without political equalities, without addressing that. Okay. So there are institutional issues in the way. A lot of places in Africa are operating on renewable energy right now, but it's things like charcoal and wood fuels. So it's that in a sense is not sustainable, but it demonstrates that there's a large population that does subsist on renewable energy currently. That's a great point. Actually, I hadn't really thought about that. And also um, climate change. Very good point. So to what extent there is a climate change future which has either, I mean it could be the best of all worlds, or it could be actually quite problematic, depending upon whether you're going to do a hydro future. Uh, I would say that one of the things that I, I uh, don't know very much about it, but I certainly remember Danny Adagoki at Penn State's research on the, the sandstorms and the Sahara, and you know, these and these cannot survive, I think, I think from my reading of the engineering work is that you can't have giant sandstorms blowing over solar collectors and not have to worry about whether or not they're going to get pitted. And I definitely know that that's an issue for turbine blades and that the testing work that's being done is to try to, you know, make them stronger than that. But so the question is, is when and under what circumstances will this be applicable to those places. Uh, think about China. Think about the urbanization of China. It's all on the southeast part of the country, right? Well, so where's the wide open flat land in that country, right? It's in the west. So what are the economics of actually generating electricity 500, 700 kilometers in one direction and then trying to pipe it into these more urban areas? Those are big questions. And then when it's when we do actually figure out what the supply is going to be, 
How is it going to integrate, and what are the social consequences of this? This is just, of course, everybody sees this spaghetti diagram, but this is so real. That's, this is, to me, this is beyond terrifying, right? Because this is people with the great, this demonstrates both hope and absolute extreme uh, lack of access to anything around the control of your energy except to tap in but place yourself in such dangerous and precarious circumstances. This is a picture of a river in China. So there are five major rivers in China, I think, is that right? Five major rivers? And I think four of them have water quality conditions which make them non-swimmable and non-fishable. So when we think about it as an energy supply, I think that it's an open question whether or not we can say that this is gonna work out as a hydro alternative. Um, and then this is a mining operation. It's also in China, but I could take you to Africa and, and show you a picture where dog mines, small, I won't call them artisanal because I don't think they're really artisanal, um, but you know, where the non-mechanization, uh, large numbers of people extracting resources and moving them into the consumption system. Um, this is an alternative future, which is the future we're gonna take. So what will drive demand for energy and what will determine its geography? So I'm asking these questions because I'm asking them myself and I don't know the answer. And if I sound like I do, I don't mean to imply that. I'm looking just like you are. So what will drive this? We know some things will drive this. We know that growth in population drives energy demand, but we also know that it really depends a lot on the level of development that a place is as the population changes through time. So the more developed, you are, your energy consumption pattern is different than in, if you are in a starting point in the development process. Uh, growth in GDP is often used as the surrogate for a measure of energy intensity because it's difficult to measure energy intensity with high precision. So as GDP goes up, we see that energy consumption goes up. And then finally, technological change. It can go both ways, right? It can stop in the middle. If, if we develop technology that is highly scalable and uh, super efficient and uh, extremely resource conserving, that's gonna produce one trajectory uh, and, and it may actually see us actually getting into a world where what we produce actually uses over time less and less energy. I have a debate going on with some of my colleagues in economics because somebody gave a talk and his projection was that um, as an, as an industry introduces a technological change, it will always be more energy consuming and always cost more. And I said, well, wait a minute, that's a choice. That's not necessarily some absolute, there's no scientific basis for that. So needless to say, we haven't solved that, that discussion. So um, what I'm, from here on out, I'm gonna be showing you a series of graphs of things that I find interesting. And they are there to help me try to figure out what's going on. And um, I want to acknowledge that there's a vast amount of research that's being done on this, and people are really literally dedicating their lives to trying to figure out, can we develop precise, precise estimates for what we're doing, how we're doing it, and its consequences? Um, and so in anything that I say or the results that I show, if I don't show you uh, calculations out of a computer which gives you some decimal level of, of precision, it's not because somebody else isn't trying to do it. It's for another reason. Um, I think that there's a lot of debate in the literature on measurement. And we see people doing top-down investigations. We see people doing bottom-up investigations. We see people doing partial investigations and investigations that are focused on equilibrium. I'm reacting to my experience trying to actually model an energy system which was the energy system of China. And what I found was that if we're relying on government statistics to try to figure out what's happening, we have to accept the possibility that there are many different reasons why statistics are collected, and there are many reasons why statistics will be collected in certain ways. And some days they could be right or tr exactly true to whatever the thing you're looking at is, like coal flowing down a rail, in a rail car flowing into a city, but there are also reasons why statistics may actually not be revealing the truth. 
Uh, and so I am um, cautious about trying to use one person's perspective or the other to explain what is the energy system globally or even in a particular place, even in the United States. I would be cautious about it because I'm not, I'm not you know, an expert on it. Um, and so what I'm going to do instead is talk about scenarios that people have been developing to try to understand what's going on. <clears throat> so you can imagine, in the absence of being able to have precise data, that we just don't pack up our books and go home and say, until we get precise data, we're not going to say anything about how the world works. Interestingly, we have a lot of people and organizations all over the world that are generating scenarios, making guesses based on pretty good engineering estimates of what we think is going to happen. Um, all the consulting firms, Booz Allen, McKinsey, uh, Boston Consulting Group, um, EDA, there's a million of them. And they are all in this business of figuring out what's going on. And they all have their own scenarios. The oil companies, they all have their scenarios. And Shell is a, particular, uh, scenar a particularly well-known producer of scenarios, and I'm going to do some of their work. Um, so what's going to happen from here on out is a characterization of reality that's somewhere maybe to where we might be. What I want to do is use them as heuristics, as learning devices, so that we can imagine, well, OK, if this process of uh, movement toward geographic concentration of populations is occurring, and it's going to occur continuing into the future, and we're going to become a very urban place really quickly. And it's not going to happen in only these big concentrations, but it's going to be spread around, and we don't actually know exactly where it's going to happen. But we have some good guesses based on past experience of how urbanization has happened. Um, what will the world look like? And where will the energy be used? And where will the energy not be used? And what does that mean for policy when it comes to privileging different types of urbanization? That's the question I want to ask. So I'm going to show you something that I, what made me cautious about doing any statistics on this. I'll show you a tool we built for that class I taught in Russia. And um, it's based on the best available data, scrounging endlessly to achieve it, down to the physical plant level, down to the railroad spur level, down to the grid spur level. And I would still say with that effort, there is a degree of error that's embedded in any of this that really makes it a great picture, but not one that I'd bet my life on. So this is a tool that we built to, to uh, So here was the problem that I decided we would do at the end of this class that we were teaching in China, in Russia. And I had 50 engineers, information technologists, scientists, and very mathematically capable people. And I had a simulator, a, a professor of engineering and simulation in mathematics, and I had an optimizer. And we got together the night before the class started, and we said, what are we going to do for the end of the class project? Because that was the problem we had to do. And I said, well, if we built this tool, why don't we just simulate the energy system for China, take coal out, and put natural gas in, and run it. Try to see if we can make it happen. So those two scientists and engineers were foolish enough to say, yes, why not? We'll try. And I had built this tool, so I had some data to be able to say we might be able to do this. But honestly, none of us. And not until the very last minute of the class did we ever think we'd be able to do that. But just to give you some idea, so what is China's problem? What is China's biggest problem today? Bar none. What keeps all those politicians in the Communist Party up at night, aside from Hong Kong? <laughs> Come on, you all know. Food is a serious problem, but it doesn't have the same qualitative concern as this thing. Actually, it's also 